Hi, uh, my name is Sandy Baird and I'm a citizen activist and I'm here with another colleague of mine by the name of Kurt Maida who's an attorney and also not much of an activist but a really good scholar. But right? active. Active, active, an active, active scholar, right. and yeah. um, very interested in politics and political yeah. affairs. And we're here today to talk about, and also, Kurt was born in India. That's right. Uh, you didn't live there very long, though, did you? Ten months. Yeah. Just ten months, and then came to the States, is now a citizen, of course, of the United States, and a practicing attorney. And we're here today to talk about the coronation of the new monarch, Right. in England from various points of view, uh, given the fact that India was a colony for a long time. But I want to rem remind our audience that was, so were we. So were we. Right. And, uh, and I just want to talk about the uh, problems that maybe people see in having monarchs still rule them, or maybe not, maybe I'm not quite certain about your view, but also the view of the monarch in other countries like India. So what's going on? Did you watch the coronation? Uh, I did not watch the coronation live. Uh, mm -hmm. I did read about it uh, did. in advance of in the advance. coronation as well as subsequently. And I did see a, a, a lot of clips on YouTube of the coronation, partly uh -huh. out of curiosity and partly because I knew we were going to be discussing this on our on our program so today. So what, um, I, I, again, I was shocked at the kind of slavish attention that the United States gave to this. Because I don't, I'm not certain that most Americans understand what the United States really did in 1776, between 1776 and 1781, when the United States threw those guys off our backs and became a republic. And so um, I'm not certain why Americans seem so still fascinated with this. Well, I mean, I think it's partly because uh, the historical background demographically speaking, of our country, the U.S. Uh, it was largely composed of uh, enslaved Africans mm -hmm. and uh, people that came from Britain, mm -hmm. who, you know, that claimed that they... In this part of the country, right? In this part of the country, yeah. that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this part of the country. And then, you know, then we had uh, people that came from France also. Mm -hmm. when we right, talk to about the Europe. north. Right, right, mm -hmm. to the north of us. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that historical link between the United States and Britain during the course of the World Wars. Uh, Any time after, in part, the uh, the War of 1812 mm -hmm. and the... The only time civil, we were invaded. Correct. Except, except for 9-11, right? That's correct, yeah, where American soil was actually... Mm -hmm. uh, violated. Violated, yeah. Mm -hmm. American soil, as we know it, yeah. not talking about Pearl Harbor, which was actually right. not a exactly. Hawaii was not a state exactly. when the Japanese mm -hmm. attacked in mm -hmm. 1941. Uh, but I, I think there's there's always been a this cross Atlantic or transatlantic relationship between uh, Great Britain and the United States. I mean, we share a language, mm -hmm. uh, we share a culture, an overall arching culture. Uh, you know. So uh, there's there's always going to be that link, and then of course, as I mentioned, you know the the relationships we had during the first and the second world war, where we were on the same side. Exactly. Uh, a friend of mine called me though yesterday, and she was kind of making the point, which was a bit unusual for her, to say that the national anthem of England is yeah. "God Save the King." Correct. God it's the same the... tune as America. Yeah, I mean, my country tis of thee versus God save the isn't it something it's like that? It's essentially yeah, yeah. It's the same I mean, song, same I, song. I guess yeah, we weren't terribly creative given. No, no, no. Maybe the, we uh, were making a point. Maybe, maybe. Maybe we were but making we an anti-monarchical in... point. Or we could have been making a point stating that you know we are kind of still brothers in. Uh, Do you think most Americans really feel that way? I, I think the the commonality in language mm -hmm. is, is religion too is quite yeah to a lesser extent now I think there are more Catholics in the U S than Protestants but uh, Britain you know with the exception of uh, Northern Ireland I think you know being largely a Protestant country mm -hmm. demographically mm -hmm. it's it's you know we're, we are different we're more, more diverse in that respect with the number of uh, Catholics we have but I mean I want to you know. 
go back to what I said about the First and the Second World War. This was further reiterated after the September 11th attacks mm -hmm. when uh, Prime Minister, Labor Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, came to the United States and was in the Rose Garden with uh, George W. Mm -hmm. Bush. Uh, and they further reiter reiterated the strong historical ties between the, the two nations. Yeah. Uh, and Britain, although, although largely the, you know, the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars were uh, manned or womaned by, by American soldiers, uh, I, I would say you know, Britain probably had the second largest contingent in, uh, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, but that could be also because Britain, especially after World War II, remained uh, the colonial kind of boss or of those two countries in particular and in well, of yeah of Iraq they had a large play yeah in Afghanistan they right. and, they, and they did in Iran also yeah in Afghanistan they left kind of with their tails between their legs yeah. in the 1800s yeah right so. right right We're part of the so-called great game between right. Britain and Russia over Afghanistan and yeah. nobody won that right but so I mean my point is you know we, we you know whether there are people that like it or not you know, we do have very strong links with Great Britain. No, I'm not, I understand that, but I want to go back to something um, yeah. that you said. Yes, but the country is deeply divided and always has been, and I'll tell you why. Which, one, I, which one? This one. Okay. Because we are also part of Latin America. Yeah. All right, and I want to go back to something that I taught at Burlington College. For many years, I taught at Burlington College, and I constructed a class, which I wasn't, I mean, I had thoughts about it, but I didn't realize how deep that I was thinking about it. And I called the class the creation of the Americas. Yeah. All of the Americas, not just the United States, right. but all of the Americas, including yeah. South America, the Caribbean, and kind of, not so much with Canada, and I'll tell you why. Hmm. So all of, basically, United States, and south and also in the Caribbean. And the, these are why. The so-called new world. The new world. Right. But I'm deliberately kind of excluding for this moment Ottawa. Okay. Ottawa, not Quebec. Okay. All right, so my, my thoughts at the time had been fueled by Lourdes Perez, who was a colleague of ours, years two, yeah. at the University of Havana in Cuba. One time on the 4th of July, prior to me teaching this class, she actually called me from Havana on the 4th of July, she said, congratulations on your great struggle for independence. Okay. And the reason she said it, she said that revolution meant so much to the Americas. And I thought, probably that's true. Probably that U.S. anti-colonial revolution was really part of a new world struggle against the problems of the old world. Colonialism, monarchy, feudalism, the lord, the idea of lords and ladies. Okay, so when you think about it, after the, our revolution, yeah. it was really quite radical. It, it was, it, yeah. It uh, said we're not gonna have monarchy anymore. We could have had monarchy. We could have chosen something like Australia, something like Canada, staying within the English Empire, keeping that government, but having more or less of a constitutional monarchy, but we didn't. Right. The United States separated from England, separated from monarchy, and was really a very radical revolution because it also uh, did, got rid of the idea of the House of Lords. It got rid of privilege, right. birth privilege, right. and established a republic. Okay, uh, it, from wait a, a minute. From a so, jury standpoint, I, I completely agree, which is extremely important because... Uh, you it's know, very I, important. Right, I mean, I think the facts on the ground were probably a bit different, but that being said, it, it was a step in the right direction if Absolutely. you want to move away from privilege. Right. At least our laws were not constructed with to favor it. With yeah, and it being inherent. Exactly in at birth. Okay. At birth. Because right. okay, a couple of other things. Also, in talking to Lourdes and then further study on my part, I realized what an example the American Revolution was to the rest of the hemisphere. 1789, revolution in France. France in 1789 became a republic, not a monarchy. Remember, they cut that guy's head off. Yeah. Okay, so France in 1789, almost more important, 1804, Haiti. Yeah. Haiti, in its anti-colonial struggle against France, becomes a black slave republic, right? right? 
all throughout Latin America by 1830, all of South America had become republics and had rejected the king of Spain or, right. or, or Portugal. I, I think uh, I think that a lot of the, a lot of countries were very much inspired what, yes, by, what, by what our founding fathers yeah. uh, did yep. and believed in, at least on paper. They, uh, some of them uh, really speak, believed and it. Some of them, some of them, yeah, yeah, to, you know, uh, be uh, fair. Uh, they, 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 yeah, they, let's they, be they fair did, about fact, them. Yeah. They did, in fact, believe that. Yeah. I mean, I interesting side point. You mentioned Haiti, you mentioned yep. countries in Latin America. Uh, there's been a significant amount of research done by an author of Scottish descent. Who? Uh, his name is William Dalyrimple. Yeah, yeah, who, yeah, I know uh, that. Who writes a fair amount about South Asia. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that not something that you're going to learn about in American history class or even in a class that's being taught in about the Americas in Latin America, but mm -hmm. a lot of the founding fathers were actually in touch uh, to the extent that you could be back then with a lot of local rulers in India. Mm. And they corresponded with one another, and they knew what was going on on the ground over there uh, in India. with respect to exploitation by British colonialists, mm -hmm. largely the East India Company, and specifically did not want that level of exploitation to take place here. And there was a significant amount of correspondence between local rulers in India and the Founding Fathers, mm -hmm. which actually continued up until, uh, you know, the War of 1812. Uh-huh, when so, we were invaded again by we the British. were again. By the right. English, right. 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 So, uh, so it, it went beyond the confines of the 13 colonies or even the Americas, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually, to the, I don't know how mail worked back in the 1700s, but there by was... ships, I suppose. I guess, yeah. right. But there was actually correspondence going to South Asia between some of our founding fathers and, and local rulers there that wanted to get rid of the uh, the British influence in that part of the world. Well, before we talk about that, let, let's say what I thought the greatest achievements of the American Revolution were, first of all, it was the Constitution. I think that was the greatest achievement. But, yeah. okay, so but what, what the United States kind of put on the record was a country that rejected monarchy. Now, why is that important? Because in a republic, which we still are, um, sovereignty is with the people. The people vote on who is going to rule them. In other words, there's government by consent, right. correct? In a monarchy, there isn't such a thing. The monarch gets born. He could be, a, he could be an idiot, as some monarchs have been accused of being. Well, I mean, you know, an interesting point, you know, we talked about the commonality between us and Great Britain. One of the things, you know, I, I mentioned specifically was language. Yes. King George, Spoke German. He, well, not only did he speak German, he didn't really speak English. Oh, really? He yeah. only spoke German? Yeah, there were two, two uh, Georges that well, were Which one kings. are you talking about? Well, George the i I'm not talking about the one who was Elizabeth's father. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about during the time of our country's independence. Okay. Uh, they, they came from the House of Hanover, Hanover, uh -huh. Germany. Right. Uh, and they uh, did not really speak a whole lot of English. <laughs> right. You know, uh, and I think the first George, if anything, you know, did not speak much English at all. Mm-hmm. I wonder about Henry VIII. Uh, no, but he... I, he, I he don't was, know about his okay, language. Okay, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. So... I, uh, I think so up until the very, First World War yeah. that they spoke. I think that's when they changed their name. To right, the, from Battenberg to Mount Batten because it what wasn't... About to to Windsor, I think that they changed it to Windsor, also to avoid, also, yeah, yeah, because of the anti-German sentiment mm -hmm. during the First World War, exactly, because Great Britain was fighting Germany, and uh, the royal family was looked at as a German institution because it largely was, right, uh, and uh, to continue its ability to reign over, you know, English speaking, an English speaking country. They decided to change their names mm -hmm. to, you know, not so, you know, on our shores here, you know, we changed, you know, Frankfurters to hot dogs and mm -hmm. uh, a couple of other things like that. Uh, but in, in Great Britain, in order to ensure their survival, uh, because kings were getting getting kicked out all over the place in Europe mm -hmm. uh, during that time frame, the the British royal family, you know, changed their they tried to, you know, kind of anglicize mm -hmm. their Germanic roots. 
Yes, I, I, I think to survive. That, yeah, to no, survive no, no. I think it's really important. I think yeah. it's really important. And also, in the glorious revolution in England in 1688, wasn't much of a revolution, actually, to, in my way of thinking. But I thought then that they imported a Protestant from the Netherlands, I think, uh, an Orangeman. That's where the whole idea of orange comes from, to be the king of England. It, England went through a brief period of time as a republic, but then Charles, to, whoever, uh, yeah, the, Oliver, there was a restoration. Oliver Cromwell, yeah, yeah right, when there was a rejection was a of monarchy. Yeah. But, the, but the thing I, I think most Americans, and most, I think, people who would regard themselves as fairly left or radical don't, understand is how important that revolution really was because it turned on its head the whole notion of sovereignty. Sovereignty in a republic comes from people like us, regardless of how little power we think we have. At least we have the power of a vote. England does not, and a monarchy does not. You get who was born into right. that family, and that's it. And remember, the other revolutionary thing was uh, our constitution was written. Most constitutions yes. these days are. Uh, but, not, but, yeah. but in Great Britain, they don't have a written constitution. Exactly. Still. Exactly. So it's, exactly. It's, a lot of it's done by, uh, by custom. Exactly, which can be changed. Certainly. Of course, constitutions so, can too. Right, but with a, with a two thirds majority, which right. is often quite. Uh, a the French task. have a written constitution, and that most happens. Country, yeah. Most countries do. I don't uh, Britain know most. Br Does India, for instance? Yeah, you know? uh, yeah. yeah, it was based on the American constitution. But American was constitution. the Indian Revolution or their struggle from independence was, in, was successful by 1947? Is that correct? Right, right. Um, was there a written constitution before that when it was a colony? of England? It was, it was run by British law. Okay, British law so, was in place. Right, yeah. exactly. That was the law of the land. The other thing that struck me and some of my friends also was the idea of there's no separation, it doesn't appear to me, of church and state in England either. Right. The Anglican church is a state church. Which is true in a lot of countries in Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, most most countries, I mean, again, Many many of these countries are a lot more secular, you know, on the ground mm -hmm. than than we are as as a country in terms so, of the number yeah. of people that you know, attend church mm -hmm. or, or or observe religious holidays. Uh, I think we have a much higher percentage, with the exception perhaps of Ireland, in terms of the number of people that you know are church going in Western Europe and the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, that being said, most of these countries, most of the countries in Scandinavia, you know. Uh, uh, recognize Lutheranism right. as, as, as the state church. Exactly. As a state church. So uh, Great Britain, it was very clear if for people to get back to the coronation topic, yes. uh, if people were able to watch the coronation about the strong links between uh, between church and state. Exactly. Even yeah. with you know the fact that they at this point they have a an Indian Hindu prime minister was reading from the the King, King James version of the Bible. They were. I didn't. Well, I didn't uh, see the, that during the mm -hmm. coronation. Mm -hmm. You know, to greet the new sovereign, essentially. So that, didn't the words too come from the Bible a lot, or come from yeah. uh, uh, religious statements of the Anglican Church? Certainly. I mean, in, in certain, thing, certain yeah. things were dialed down a little bit. Oh. Uh, I mean, the ceremony in general, you know, I think was less. Uh, less Protestant and less white intentionally to try to uh, make the institution appear or try to appear a little more uh, uh, inclusive mm -hmm. because Britain is a multicultural, multi-religious society now. Uh, so uh, I think there were certain attempts to uh, de-emphasize some of the roots, but then other things were not de-emphasized. Intentional, right. intentionally. I think the thing about England that's so misunderstood also is that, you know, I want to get back to this religious thing, is that England is a democracy. It is in no way a democracy. It is a monarchy. And it's, I guess, constitutional in that it has a house, a parliament, right, right which I suppose in some ways reigns in the power of the monarchy. But then there's a House of Lords, which is a feudal kind of notion, actually. Right. Again, people get into that House of Lords by birth. Not by election, and but you know that being said, I mean I know our founding fathers were trying to move away yes. from that. You mentioned specifically the House of Lords, right. but up until uh, I think it was sometime in the 1800s, our senators right. were not elected. 
Correct, but yeah, they are now. They are now. They right. are now. But they are now. at the time of the design of the country, mm -hmm. you know, uh, legally speaking. Right, they came uh, from the state legislatures, didn't they? Correct, didn't, correct. Didn't but they were not happen. elected. Right. Yeah, so but there was a progressive movement in this country right. that uh, demanded and got a progressive reform of the Senate so that they now are directly elected. But, yeah. but the point is about the United States is that it was the earliest revolution against all this nonsense of privilege, against the idea of a state church. So of course it wasn't as cut and dry as sure. it could have been. But, but, it's, uh, but on paper it yeah. largely was, which yeah. was radical in and of itself very, at that time. Exactly, that's what yeah. I think too. And there's a very, uh, historian that's still alive that wrote a great deal about this and his name is Gordon Wood and he wrote a book that I was very influential in my life called The Radicalism of the American Revolution and I don't think most Americans understand most Americans I would put that I've associated with who are basically on the left and they consider the American Revolution I think is very very imperfect particularly because it didn't abolish slavery right, right. Um, and that's a huge problem Certainly. However, there were people, even among the founding fathers, that wanted to even abolish slavery. Well, I mean, Hamilton was not a slave Hamilton owner. was and was an abolitionist, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. And I mean, he, he was born. He was actually Saint Kitts in uh, Saint Croix, Saint Kitts, yeah. uh, those islands, and he was able Who's to that? see the brutality of slavery very close up, very early on, and was you know a lifelong abolitionist. Well, so were the Adams family, the, one of our first presidents, uh, yeah. one of the first, I don't know what they called themselves, Federalists at the time. Right. I mean, there was right. a big split between people who were Federalists. And who the, were, the Anti-Federalists. And the Anti-Federalists, but yeah. the Federalists were against slavery. Right. Largely, and the Anti-Federalists were also against slavery, but they were also against the centralization of power. As well. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, there. Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people will look at what we're saying and and probably point out uh, a lot all of all the flaws, flaws and the inconsistencies yeah. because many of these, uh, you know, men at the mm -hmm. time were also you know huge landowners, yep, and slave and owners, plant, and plant and owned plantations, mm -hmm. and therefore you know in many cases owned you know hundreds of slaves. Sure. Yeah. Including George Washington himself. Including George Washington. Um, and Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Correct. Yeah. However, that argument is always made. The argument, though, that is not as, as successfully being made is that there were a lot of uh, our founding fathers who were against slavery right. and who wanted it to be abolished. And then there was a the big compromise in the debates in Philadelphia. So it's... I think that American history would always show throughout our history a real dialectic. Sure. As and at the time, it's also important just in terms of context since our topic yes, it, is it, the coronation. Sure, sure. That I, I don't think uh, Britain outlawed slavery until 1807. No, but that was outlawing the slave trade. The slave trade. The right. slave trade. And the right. United States did not join that. No. The United States continued. Well, yeah, but I, I think after 1808, on paper, I know it was done. There were slave ships yep. that came from here. Africa here, yeah. but uh, supposedly the the idea was they were not going to bring new slaves. Right. From Guess Africa. why? Yeah. Because we the, had an internal market at that right, point. Right. We had a significant we internal had, market. We didn't need the international slave trade by that point. Yeah. I'm not denying Even the contradiction. Yeah. I'm not denying at all the contra contradiction between those of our founding fathers who wanted a republic and yeah. who wanted freedom. Right and also those founding fathers who wanted to continue slavery, because there right. were a lot of them too. And that re resulted in a very famous compromise called the Three-Fifths Rule, you remember that? Right, right. Which, which allowed slaves to be counted for representation as only three-fifths of a person. Of a human person. But that right. debate led to a whole debate about slavery as right. well. And then right. there was a compromise which the North compromised on by saying, we need to keep this union together. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think happened is that because Well, that's what it was all about. Yeah. 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 I mean, because yeah, the South was certainly uh, ready to move on. Exactly. You know, and I think there were a lot of attempts to compromise mm -hmm. unfortunately you know, at the at the expense of human lives. Right. But but, what uh, if but it to try to keep been? the uh, to try to keep the uh, country together. It never it never hit me why in other words 
until I understood that, what Lincoln was all about in a way too, because if the South had been successful in not only maintaining slavery, which they were, but also at go, if, if the North hadn't compromised and kept the South in the Union, guess what would have happened? South might have gone on its own way and then we would have been retaken over by the English, I bet you. Yeah, well, I mean, the interesting point uh, is during the course of the Civil War. Yes. The Great Britain mm -hmm. was largely on the part, on the side of the, the South. South. Even though this Great Britain at that point had abolished slavery right. and, and the slave trade, mm -hmm. uh, they were, you know, partly, I mean, the British. Commercially. Yeah. It, there were commercial reasons. There was always a, a British um, theory to. Uh, its foreign policy was always about div divide and conquer, and that that, right. would, that would significantly weaken the the new country, the United States, totally. uh, by splitting it in half. Right. We would have uh, what, just been six, seven states in the north versus bigger populations in the south, I would guess, because of slavery. because of slavery. Right. Okay, I want to ask you a question, though, as uh, being born in India. So why have the British kept the monarchy so firmly? Is it a symbol of some sort? I mean, I, I think honestly, it's uh, it, it's largely symbolic at this point. You know, well, what uh, does it serve to do? A symbol of what? Empire. It's tradition uh -huh. in large part. I mean, look, the people you know, the people that go to visit Bra Great Britain, uh, a good part of it. I mean, you know, my parents, my parents were you know over the weekend. My father specifically was criticizing. You know, why do they have this? You know, what what why do they still have this monarchy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my Good parents. Your father. Yeah, but yeah, my parents and I had to rem remind my father that uh, didn't you guys go to Great Britain and didn't you spend a bunch of money to get tickets to go see Buckingham Palace and the changing of the guard and mm -hmm. all that stuff? And he said, "Well, yeah." So I said, "Well, that's you know, I think it's um, I think there's tourism. I think it brings up interest about Great Britain." when people get involved in the drama of the royal family, whether it's you know, <laughs> yeah. Princess Diana or who's dating whom. Or Markle. And Andrew, you know, and his, you know, Prince Andrew's, you know, legal issues with Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. Uh, so I think it makes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a living soap opera. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, that's why they continue to have it in large part. I don't think governmentally it has much of anything. Uh, you know, the oh, well, they can call off Parliament as they as they did in Canada, even right, right, and so called prorogue it, right. right, right. But you know, in terms of you know, I and I think it was a symbol of unity during during the World Wars, also mm -hmm. uh, that they looked at the sovereign. You know, so I don't I don't have any problems with a largely it appears to be a largely ceremonial post. Uh, but I think at this it, point, it is, even though historically it wasn't. At, I at think, one point. to me, as um, and I guess I favor in general most of the world's revolutions. I think that the British monarchy is a symbol of real conservatism, of real like, don't go there to a republic, don't go there to sovereignty, you people. Keep this uh, symbol of order and privilege. It is a huge symbol to me of privilege. Unlike the Americas, like we have privileged people. I don't know if I use the word. There's plenty of yeah, pr plenty of wealthy people here. I'm certain I use the word privilege. Yeah. We have people with enormous advantage, especially, yeah. especially. I would use that word to say m probably better than privilege. I think most, many white people are born. But white I mean, I'm not even. I'm not even talking about. Well, you know, you certainly have an argument there. But I'm not even talking about demographically. I'm mm -hmm. talking about. People that have a lot of money that were born into wealth, regardless yes. of their color or background, are at a distinct advantage yeah, over that's what people I said. that are yes. not, regardless of their color. Right, I uh, agree about advantage, yeah. but not the way a person is born and is going to be the monarch. Could be an idiot. Yeah. You know, at least somebody who's born with money, yes, they have an enormous advantage. However, nobody in this country is born destined to be. A monarch. Remember the mo what it means, rule by one. Right. That's what monarchy is, rule by one born person. Certainly. But I mean, if, you know, look, historically, I mean, there have been b benevolent monarchs, ah. you know, in countries. I mean, you know, there was a famous story, you know, during the Second World War 
that when the uh, when the Germans uh, invaded Denmark, Denmark had a king. Yeah. I think his name was King Christian. Christian, uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Oddly enough, and uh, when the the Nazis took over, they ordered their Jewish citizens in Denmark to have to wear a Star of David. So the, the you know the king by decree mm -hmm. said everyone's going to wear a Star of David. Yep. You know, including him. You know? I'm not so, saying that. I mean, yeah, right. You can't have you know benevolent monarchs. Uh, I know historically the British were not. But I think largely it's a ceremonial position. So I, uh, my we attitude is to... let them have their silly party and you know wearing, you know, the, these ridiculous looking. They can robes. have any party it, they want. Yeah, I mean, I'm it looked like Halloween. That. It looked I'm like saying... Halloween to me, large. I think large that they part. are still a symbol of enormous privilege, and that the world doesn't need any more symbols of privilege and of keeping order among a bunch of fractious colonies. You know. Anyway, but. There was one other thing that that I was going to uh, say about that, but I, I but I think what the American Revolution really did establish was a type of rough equality. People can right. overcome that equality by earning or by inheriting piles of money, but the principle in this country is still equal rights it, under the law. That's the idea. Yeah, I mean, has it been uh, perfect? Not even close. Not. Yeah, but but at least that was the the governing idea. And still is. And still is, yeah. Sort of. Yeah, which is, I think, largely what the, you know, the concept of the American dream is, is based on. And that that's anyway. what Lincoln's, okay, final thought. There was a second revolution in this country I want people reminded of also. First revolution, get rid of the monarchy, establish a republic and a constitution. Second revolution was to get rid of slavery. Right. And many historians call that also a revolution to sort of culminate the ideas of uh, the U.S. Revolution, and I guess that's the way I see it also. But Lincoln had the same problems that many of our founding fathers did. He had to compromise, right. if you all remember that. But in the end, slavery was abolished. And the question was whether Lincoln would have proceeded with an abolition of slavery had there been a larger compromise yes, could with be. the South, because yeah. the abolition of slavery, the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, many have contended, Mm -hmm. was largely military strategy. Yes, but military, right. Because it was, it was signed during the course of the Civil right. War, and the uh, idea was that it would create havoc in the South if all of a sudden you have all these new free people just, you know, well, and, uh, possibly sabotaging, uh, you know, the, the, the Southern uh, war effort. Well, you're, I agree and I don't agree. Yes. There were states that stayed with the Union that were pro-slavery and had slaves. No, they were neutral. Or neutral. They were neutral. You right. won't know why. Lincoln said, quote, I have to have Kentucky on my side. And West Virginia. And no. maybe West Virginia probably no. also. And I don't believe state. Missouri either. Maybe was in the part of the Confederacy, although I'm not sure. Don't know. I have to have Kentucky. I have to have Kentucky, and I'm hoping that God's on my side, because he did have to. If he could cut off those states from joining the Civil War, that was his military strategy. If they had become part of the Confederacy, it might have the North might have lost. The other thing was the Emancipation Proclamation only applied I know, to the to, those. to the rebelling states. Exactly, it did not apply to the states that remained neutral. I know that, and on, essentially on the side of the North, I that know. continued to have slavery. But that was what you're saying is correct. It was military strategy more than anything. He could not have won that war if he hadn't adopted that strategy. Okay, but the Emancipation Proclamation is really important because you've got to remember the struggle that took place after the Civil War, which was the 13th Amendment. Yeah. He was part of that. He made sure At that that, that point, got certainly. passed. Right. right. And that was the only time it could have been passed because I don't even think the Southern states were in the Congress at that point, were they? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not certain. I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. In fact, they were on their way or something like right. that. But and the Lincoln, 13th, 14th, and 15th, 15th Amendments. Right. But they, the thirteenth was passed with Lincoln. The fourteenth, no, he was already no. dead. Yeah, he had already been uh, assassinated. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and the reason he was assassinated was that he had fought that war. I think his goal was always to eliminate slavery. However, he had to pick a strategy that would win that fight, and that's why the eighteen sixty three Emancipation also allowed black soldiers to be in the war. Yeah. Anyway, you know, there's a great movie on this subject. Did you ever see Glory? 
No. Oh no, my God, Kurt, you have got to no? see it. Okay. It's All right, the story of the Massachusetts 54th. You know what that is? Yeah. That was the first black regiment that went off to fight. To fight in the Civil War. Right yeah. after the emancipation in 1863. Amazing. It's amazing. It's the best movie. Yeah. But I'm not. I'm also saying it from a historian's point of view because it was criticized by a very famous uh, Civil War historian who said it was also accurate. Glory is fairly accurate. Is that right? Yes, okay. I have a copy. Sometime we should see it together. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? A copy of what? Of the movie. Right. No, I have the movie. You know, no, I'm but, saying but in, it's in, it, in 2023 terms. To, to, this is a VHS. What do you right, think? Right, I would right. That's have? what I. That's what that's I thought. What I have. I'm just trying to explain to our young viewers what yeah. a copy means. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, but you, right. I don't know how many young viewers <laughs> right. that we have in the first one. But thank you very much, Kurt, for our welcome. Brilliant discussion, I guess, of monarchy. Thank so, you. Thank you for having me, Sandy. Too bad for England. Okay. Let them have their party. Yeah, Looked like right. Halloween to me. Cool.